Good evening, everyone, and welcome to an evening with rats, in which we intend to showcase some of the topics we've been dealing with lately, which we think are of interest to you as cruising sailors. So this is the running order. I'm going to this is my introduction. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is rats. John's then going to talk about orca, Rick about wind farms, Mike about cruising in Europe, Roger about VAT, and Richard about CE and RCD issues. And then we will have ample time for your questions and answers, both from the audience here at CA House and from those uh, accessing this meeting remotely. So what is RATS? It's an acronym. It stands for Regulatory and Technical Services. A little bit of history. As we know, the CA was founded in 1908 and for the first 40 odd years was ruled by Hansen. Around the time of the end of the Second World War, and certainly by the early 1950s, a cruising committee was formed to deal with all the non-geographic information which uh, members needed. Um, in 19, and, and the cruising committee carried on. In 2000, the momentous decision to change the name to RATS was made. Um, and the reason for this was to, to distinguish it Cruising Committee of the Cruising Association was a bit of a tongue twister. Um, and um, RATS is now a well, a well established brand, both within the CA and with outside bodies such as government, um, the yachting press, um, and uh, wind farm operators and others. So, what we do is broadly the same as we, uh, as we did when the Cruising Committee was first formed. So on the regulatory side, it's everything to do with regulations that affect cruising. Um, so it's, it's the rules of, of, of the law of the sea, um, regulatory matters such as VAT, um, RC and RCD, as you'll hear a bit later on. On the technical side, we're very interested in all the technical aspects of cruising. And we have, we've done various um, projects on this, including fire prevention at sea, um, we're looking at the emissions, um, electrical propulsion. And a large part of our work is questions to rats. Um, when I first joined uh, rats about five years ago, we got two or three questions a month. We're now running in the hundreds a year group. Um, and this, this is pr uh, probably greatly driven by Brexit and the need for questions, particularly on VAT, but also on 9180. Um, but I just think uh, the, the work, work on questions to rats will continue, but hopefully not at quite such an intense rate. So how we work? Well, we work collectively. Um, everything is subject to peer review. Um, and uh, we have a saying that, that the work is always a draft until we publish it. So our, we recognize our work can always be improved. Okay, so everything you hear this evening and all the answers to the questions are subject to this disclaimer, which means we do our best to answer, but there's no legal comeback if we fail to get something right. Okay, I'm now going to hand over to John to talk about Orca. Thank you very much indeed, Robin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk about citing Orca. In most parts of the world, people pay to go out on boats and get as close as they can to uh, seeing these uh, beautiful animals. They're quite spectacular. Excellent communicators. They work very successfully in teams. Uh, there are plenty of David Attenborough um, films about the way they behave. They eat either fish or mammals. Uh, also known as killer whales, although they are in fact the largest dolphins, and they some countries that translate their name translates into wolves of the sea. However, off the Iberian coasts, Spain, Portugal, and uh, France, they've become dangerous. It started in 2020. There were 51 interactions then and uh, just over half the boats were damaged, and then a significant increase in 2021. Uh, 91 damaged, and then last year, fewer interactions reported, more boats damaged, and indeed, two sunk. 
the uh, in 2020 there were only three orca doing this, but they uh, passed their knowledge on to uh, many of their uh, peers. There are uh, the particular uh, family or community in question is called the Gibraltar Straits uh, pod or Gibraltar, Gibraltar Straits community. There are 35 of them. But tw by 2021, 14, nearly half, were in, uh, involved in this uh, action. And then in 2022, one more joined. So it's just, just short of half of them uh, that uh, involved in this uh, dangerous behaviour. As a result of what happened in 2021, one of our members, Paul Lingard, approached Mike Eastman, who you're going to hear of later, one of the rats, and they proposed that we team up with uh, GTOA and uh, come up with more useful advice and information for sailors. The marine biologists in GTOA have been uh, studying these uh, this particular uh, community for decades, really. And they understood about how orca behave, but they weren't really aware. They, were, they didn't know how best to present advice and guidance for sailors. So the, the partnership uh, that we uh, uh, created with them was that the Cruising Association would look at the issues from the uh, sailors and cruise side, and GTOA would look at the uh, situation from the marine biologist side. And we linked, first of all, linked the websites. Then we created a much more detailed reporting process. It's web enabled. It's uh, in four languages, French, Spanish, Portuguese, as well as English. We uh, took the GTOA advice and made that available on our website as well. And then we throughout the reporting, uh, since we started the partnership, we've shared the findings. So the report, the detailed reports come to us. We uh, remove the uh, uh, the personal details and publish them. We send the whole report to GTOA. They, in return, if they find out about incidents we don't know about already, then they either submit a report on behalf of the skipper or uh, encourage the skippers to report. So it's a, it's a very effective partnership. And you'll see there the two websites, one for the top one for GTOA, and then the second one, which is ours. Of these more detailed reports, the uh, done some analysis of the first hundred, and you'll see that just over a quarter of them, there were no actual, no actual damage. So the orca came and they swam around the yacht or perhaps brushed up alongside it. But for whatever reason, and, and no one at the stage knows why, they decided not to cause any damage. At the other end, uh, slightly more were very seriously damaged. And the and, and most of those needed a tow. And the interactions lasted between 10 minutes very short and well over an hour once again the the number of orcas it, it involved varied significantly between one of, often a um, quite a large single orca would come in at high speed uh, break off the rudder or, or seriously damage it and then leave and other times, up to six orca, sometimes uh, the reports say that the, uh, an adult stands off and appears to be communicating and directing juveniles to do the attack. Once the rudder or part, a large part of the rudder is broken off, they play with it sometimes and then lose interest. And as I said earlier, the, um, uh, the, the behavior varies between curiosity poking around the boat and very violent attacks. The, um, uh, they play with the boats, they spin them around 360 degrees. They've, there's been a report of, of, a, of a boat being pushed at up to six knots. And unfortunately they happen day and night. 
Where? Where do they occur? Well, in 2021, they were mostly down at the, in, uh, off um, Cadiz, and then they moved through the season up to the northwest coast of uh, Spain. And in fact, there was a similar pattern in 2020. This last year, the interactions were much further north, and you'll see there that there are nine in Biscay, seven were roughly where we might expect because the tuna, that's where the tuna that they uh, eat, are migrating that way. But there are also two uh, on the east side of Biscay. The furthest north was one that's only 90 miles from the Scilly Isles, which is really getting quite close. But the majority were off the Portuguese coasts, northwest um, uh, uh, Spain or um, southwest Portugal. For each of these locations, if you press the button on the website, you will get, you can, you, you can, go down through the layers and you can get the full detailed report so you can read what the weather was like what the, um, the sea conditions you can read the, the details of what the skippers said um, about the nature of the interaction so you can get the full details so how do you avoid if you're sailing in these waters how do you avoid and uh, being damaged. Well, what we say before you go, read the safety protocol so that you can follow it if you need to. You know, don't wait until the interaction. Read it first. Ideally, get a larger yacht. Most of the interactions have occurred in yachts significantly less than 15 meters long. We don't know why, but uh, th th that's what the data shows. Stay in shallow water, less than um, 20 metres, and close to the shore, less than two miles. The problem with that, of course, off Portugal, is the number of fishing pods. And then avoid the most active periods. And the active periods are shown on a traffic light system on the GTOA website. So this is, uh, uh, I ran this off at the beginning of uh, uh, beginning of February, and you'll see that there are no no reds, but there are there's one uh, um, amber and and a whole lot of greens. About ten days ago, I ran it again, and you'll see that there's now a red off southwest Portugal, and that's as a result of a number of attacks during in in the middle of February in that area, and that's caused a race to be rerouted. The race was due to come out of Lisbon and uh, and pass through those waters. The organisers have rerouted the race. And if you're attacked, do what? Well, the follow the safety protocol is, is the first piece of advice, which says stop, because if you keep moving, it tends to keep the uh, the adrenaline um, uh, pumping in the orca. Let go of the steering. The some of the attacks are so violent. If you're holding the steering when it happens, either the tiller or the wheel, you're likely to end up with a broken wrist, broken arm, or even being knocked across the cockpit. Then reverse if the uh, conditions allow. Waves and wind. That seems to work because the the orca can't swim backwards they can't so they and they can't get to the rudder if you're swimming if you're uh, reversing a sudden loud noise the sudden crack of a genome uh, uh, going across with a, um, a standing tack or standing jibe or loud pots and pans appears to have driven them off sometime and then the final one is sand because they um, they hunt using sonar, they identify the rudder using sonar. We know this because there's a yacht which has got uh, propellers astern of the rudders and the uh, orca were unable to get to the rudders because as they came forward, their sonar was picking up an object 
between them and the rudder and so they didn't attack they they kept coming in but they didn't actually damage the rudder and the marine biologists say that sand does the same thing what it does it it uh, provides a sort of a, a sonar curtain around the rudder which gives them a confusing message and they give up and, and um go and do something else so they leave the boat and uh uh, without damaging it. So what are we doing? Um, this year we're going to carry on trying to help as much as possible. We're going to update our website so it's got all the latest advice and guidance. We're going to publicise the risk and the need for the reports. We want to make sure that everybody who's sailing in the area knows what the risks are. We're going to carry on taking the reports and publishing them and we've got a, a, a data analysis company called continuum from jersey who for uh, pro, bo pro bono are helping us with uh, detailed analysis of the data as we get more reports in we will be um, submitting them to continuum to see whether they can get any more uh, guidance and advice for us and then we're going to test hypotheses so I talked about reversing. Well, what we're not sure is whether we should try and reverse in a straight line or whether reversing in a circle is more effective. And we're doing some more detailed analysis on that at the moment. The Portuguese government, the Portuguese Navy, the Portuguese Navy uh, run the um, rescue services are really concerned about uh, these uh, interactions now. And they ran last Friday, they ran a whole day conference that we were invited to. Uh, we um, we watched it live with, with uh, Mike, who's talking later because he speaks Portuguese. At the end of the presentation, at the end of the um, conference, they came up with these four um, uh, what, uh, future uh, actions. They're going to encourage, actively encourage reports of not only interactions but also sightings uh, at the moment this you can report sightings on on an app called uh Orkinus, and uh gtoa are about to launch another app but the intention is that uh the portuguese navy will develop a, a, an effective alert system in real and they'll publish that in real time make it available in real time that's that's the intention. The other uh, area that they're going to look at, into is acoustic devices. You can get pingers which claim to work. You can use um, various other noise making devices. But at the moment, everything that's on the market would appear to damage the hearing of orcas, and the uh, the effectiveness of pingers has it hasn't been proved. Indeed, there's a, a French boat was attacked when it was using a pinger. So the uh, Portuguese intend to do the research and experimentation with a view to coming up with something that's effective. And then finally, I've talked about the safety protocol. Um, it was updated in sort of September, October last year, but nothing much has happened to it since. And what the Portuguese want to do is make it a, um, a living document. So I started by saying in most parts of the world, people would be delighted to go out on a boat and see Orca. However, if you're sailing off the Iberian coasts this summer and you see this, what would you be thinking now? Thank you very much. I'll now hand over to Rick, who's going to talk about wind farms. Thank you, John, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just, uh, oh, I need to move on to my slide. There we go. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to whisk through very, very quickly um, the, the current situation with um, offshore wind farms uh, in the UK and around Europe. Uh, so it will be a whisk through. But um, first of all, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about why RATS is involved in this. I mean, we uh, represent the interest of recreational boaters in the UK 
in the planning consultations when the new wind farms are coming up for planning and uh, development. And it goes back many years as involvement before my time with rats, in fact. And, uh, but we have been, my, my colleagues, former colleagues, been very influential in allowing freedom to transit through UK wind farms. Uh, it's not quite the same in other parts of Europe, but um, just to say we're currently involved in eight consultations with uh, looking at, involved in hazard workshops where we're looking at what the hazards might be, particularly for uh, recreational boaters. So that's what we basically are doing. It's mostly offshore wind farms, although, there could be other things that we would look at, such as uh, uh, wind power and, and so on, but uh, mostly the wind farms. I don't know how many of you are aware, but the, 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 the growth in the number of wind farms is enormous. And there's currently more than 40 operational ones around the UK coast. Uh, and there are many more, perhaps up to 200 that I haven't been able to identify exactly, but um, they're under construction being planned. Um, many, many others in other parts of Europe, so we need to be we need to be aware of it. We need to know where they are. But I want to make the point as I move forward that we shouldn't be daunted by them. They're no probably no more problematic than any other um, passage you might plan. <clears throat> so this is a, just a brief summary summary of what's operating and planning around the coast of England and Wales. The dark magenta ones are uh, are the ones that are operational. Others show those being planned or uh, under construction at the moment. You can see where the concentration is. Uh, there's a concentration in sort of Morecambe Bay area in the Eastern Irish Sea. Uh, there's a lot all the way down the East Coast um, being uh, so particularly, we know about probably about those coming out of the Thames, but there's um, others at Dogger Bank and further north. And just not so much on the South Coast, but for those of you who sail in or around the Isle of Wight area, there are probably quite a lot of you here. Um, there's the Rampion wind farms, which are right the way between Brighton and uh, Eastbourne and so on across to the coast of France. So um, if you're sailing across probably east to west from the Isle of Wight, uh, you probably go inside them, but they are there and uh, might need to consider navigating through them. Uh, Scotland, just the same. The um, operational ones are the sort of smaller number of orange ones there. The, uh, the blue ones are uh, the ones that Scott Wind is the sort of the, deals with the licensing of these sites, but that uh, shows currently what's, what's uh, being considered for licensing and planning. Then wind farms in the Eastern North Sea and the Baltic Sea. Um, the uh, there's, these are what operational at the moment. I uh, don't have full details. They're all being planned in these areas. But you can see there's also a, a red dot in the Iselmere there. So there are wind farms in the in the sort of uh, inland waters, we might call them. And there are probably others in inland, larger inland lakes. But uh, uh, certainly the concentration in the Baltic there is at the, in the western end. And then France, uh, there's only one that's currently operational. Uh, and it's shown just off San Nizar there, but there are others being planned down through the, all around the coast and some in the Mediterranean as well. The reason why the fewer in some of these other European countries is that they're much more difficult in the UK to get currently to get planning for onshore wind farms, whereas most of the other European nations have tended to develop onshore to start with. But they're, they're, I won't use, well, I was going to say catching up. It's not quite catching up, but they're seeing the benefits of offshore as well. Spain and Portugal, it's quite early days there, but the many, many being planned um, in Spain, it's, it's Canary Islands and around the northwest coast, Portugal uh, developments planned all the way down. So you've got wind, you'll have wind farms to contend with as well as orca and fishing nets if you sail down that coast. So you dodge between all of them, take your pick. So what, uh, what are the restrictions on navigating through wind farms? Because you can go through them. It's not, uh, you don't have to go around them. That's the key thing. And this little sort of, again, traffic light system, the UK, you're free to transit. Uh, no restrictions whatsoever. You just have to show proper seamanship and, 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 
act as you would anywhere else. There's one small restriction which I'll come to. Um, Denmark is the same, but then Netherlands, France, Germany, uh, well, Germany, Baltic, anyway, there are some restrictions. But if you actually look at them, 24 meters, there won't be that many of us who have boats bigger than 24 meters. And certainly if we're in a sailing boat, we won't exceed 12 knots. Um, you should have an active AIS, which a lot of us do these days. And there are some restrictions in Germany and Baltic, uh, Germany uh, in the Baltic Sea uh, on wind force. You've got to can't go through any gale and you can't go through in poor visibility. But on the face of it, any of us, most of us in our boats could sail through any of those wind farms. Where there seem to be severe restrictions are Germany in the North Sea area, off the coast of Germany there, and in Belgium. But I don't pretend that I've got all the precise detail here. So if anybody has anything else you'd like to add, then please contact RATS and let us know because we'll update this and make it more precise, we hope. I, I thought we might just like to get some scale of what a, a wind turbine looks like. And this is showing what the latest larger wind, wind turbines are like. And you can see that the blade of a wind turbine is bigger than the length of a football pitch. So it just shows how big they are. You've got a minimum clearance between mean high water springs of 22 meters. So I wouldn't suggest you want to get that close to be under them. And in fact, the one restriction is that I would uh, we'll come to in a moment as well is 50 meters. You shouldn't get close than 50 meters to any of these, but, um, <clears throat> but they're large, very, very large. This is just showing what you might see on a large scale chart. Um, showing all the cabling as well. I'm not, I wouldn't recommend anybody to anchor inside a wind farm, but you technically, if you, if you needed to in a, uh, in an emergency, which would be better than smashing into a wind turbine, I think, then um, you could do because the depths are supposed to be at least one meter. Although with the sort of, you know, the sort of things that can happen and the bed of the sea, you can never be absolutely sure about that. But that's the, that's the situation anyway. Navigating, I just mentioned this, you've got a 15 meter restriction around the zone of each pylon. Uh, during construction, certainly uh, there are more restrictions. I haven't had time to cover that, uh, the details are more complex, but you generally keep 500 meters clear then, that's the, that's the restriction. Obviously keep clear if work boats around. But they are marked, all, all the turbines and the, the, the wind arrays, as they're called, are marked with, with standard voyage. Uh, and in fact, with the wind turbines show up well on radar as well. Certainly from a distance, they show up well. So if you have radar, that's, that's good. You should use up-to-date charts, of course, if you're navigating. And if anybody, any of you are considering sailing through any wind farms, I suggest you get download for free a copy of the Marine and Coast Guard Agency guidance note, uh, MGN 372 Amendment 1 is full title, but that's quite easy and it does give you lots of extra information. So in, in summary, I'd say that where wind farm is open for transit, you don't need to avoid it. If you want to go through it, you can do. Be aware of restrictions, obviously, but just plan as if you were going through any other, any other hazardous area, rocks or narrow, narrow uh, entrances or whatever and importantly use up-to-date charts and remember to zoom in if you're using electronic charts because you might not see the detail if you don't and finally just say that rats will continue to monitor developments and uh, hopefully look after the interests of ca members thank you very much indeed i'll hand over now to thank you and over to Mike Eastman, who's going to be uh, online talking to us, I think. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much indeed, Rick. Um, can I be heard okay? Hope so. Please uh, tell me if not. Um, could I have my first slide, please? Oh, that works as well. This is marvelous. <clears throat> I'll start with some Good news. For many who are traveling out to their boat in Europe this year, it is still possible and relatively simple. The permitted 90 days out of 180 days, which is counted on a rolling basis, 
which UK citizens can spend in the EU without a visa may allow you to spend all the time you have sailing where you want to be. Please do note that uh, this evening, uh, what I'm saying relates specifically to UK passport holders. It may well be similar for other non-EU passport holders, but there are some important differences. Uh, next, please. And do note also that there are very significant differences between the time that you can spend in the EU and the times which your boat can spend in the EU. Um, my colleague Roger will be dealing with the boat position in his talk, which is straight after my slot now. Next. The position for the majority of people this year then is likely to be quite similar to last year. Although later in the year, uh, the entry and exit system, the EES, and the European Travel Information and Authorization System, ETIAS, uh, are planned to come into operation. Uh, all countries have uh, a lot to do to achieve this, um, and the French, just to uh, complicate matters, have just within the last uh, two or three days said that they don't want to introduce EES this year because they've got the Paris Olympics next year. So really the timing of this is anyone's guess at the moment. Uh, another topic for another day. Not going to deal with that this evening. <clears throat> next. Um, I worked out my own travel plans for the first part of this year, and I was quite surprised to find that despite going backwards and forwards to our boat in different European locations, and uh, I hope getting plenty of sailing in, I can get almost all of the time I want uh, out there this year within the 90 day limit. Um, so don't be put off by the well publicized problems which can result from the limit of 90 days uh, allowed to non-EU citizens. Work out very carefully how these can affect you. It may not be the problem you thought it was. The Schengen calculator, which is at the side of the, the right hand side of the slide here, uh, is quite helpful for that. And you can see my own calculations for the first part of the year here. Um, but of course, for, for many of us uh, who are accustomed to spending quite long spells uh, through the sailing season in Europe, it will be a problem. And if that's the case, you need to have some strategies uh, available to you now and to understand how you can use those. Next slide, please. First of all, many CA members sail with their partner or another family members. Uh, and if you are a close family member of a European citizen, that's your best solution. It does seem like quite a number of people are in this fortunate situation. The position is that EU law gives the right of free movement within all the countries of the Union for all EU citizens. And this right extends to their close family members when either accompanying or joining to travel, uh, traveling to join the EU citizen. Close family members mean spouse, highly obviously, uh, in several countries of the Union, uh, a legal partner is uh, regarded in the same way, dependent children under 21, and dependent parents and grandparents are all included in uh, the, the close family group. So if you are in that position, make sure that you have all the relevant documentation to evidence that, and you have a simple and convenient means to travel freely and for considerably longer than 90 days in any 180 rolling days. So far so good, but there are still an awful lot of people who are going to be limited to the 90 days. So next slide, please. Um, if you are limited by those rules, you've either got to investigate getting a visa of some sort to enable you to stay longer than the basic 90 days, or have a look at changing your cruising plans. There might be some alterations, uh, flexibility that you can build into them that uh, perhaps you haven't considered. Next slide. Let's look first, though, at the potential for visas or permits, which can help. We've described already in our recent article in the Cruising magazine 
the process for obtaining these visas uh, for both France and Sweden in some detail. CA have got quite a lot of experience of that and the relevant sections have done uh, a lot to publicize that. Still uh, somewhat complex for both countries, uh, or at least tedious to actually get and not inexpensive, but once you've got it, uh, they allow you to stay for up to 180 days in the country which issues the visa. And that may include traveling to and from that country without taking up any of your allowance of 90 days out of the 180. So that may well be your solution. Other countries are offering extended stay visas, which we know a little bit about, uh, which are relevant for UK citizens. These include Croatia and Greece, and uh, coming soon, we believe, but probably a bit further down the line, maybe Spain and Portugal. There is also a more general extended stay visa, which is available across most or all EU countries, the Type D visa, which quite recently has had tourism included as a reasonable purpose for travel. We're getting some information on this, um, although this is quite recent, and we would very much like to find members who are looking at ways to extend their stays this year, specifically in Italy, Spain and Portugal. If that uh, is you, please do get in touch with us afterwards. Um, we would like to uh, try and help you and to find out more about how it works ourselves. So. Those of you who have or are looking into getting visas and permits of this sort may well be finding that at the moment these are not simple or quick to obtain. But I do think that there is reason to be fairly optimistic. The income from UK tourists has been significant for a good number of countries and those countries don't want to lose this, just as we don't want to lose going out to the sun and the many other attractions of these countries. So it's highly probable that over the next few years, the situation will change in many respects, all probably for the better. But it keep us on our toes while we uh, track the changes. Next slide, please. Um, the other possibility that I suggested earlier that you could perhaps look at is where you would like to cruise. Uh, just have a look and see if there are alternative places which you might be able to include. For example, if you keep your boat in Spain, how would a visit to Morocco for a bit work for you? Or if you're cruising the north coast of Brittany, perhaps, could you come back to UK or to Ireland for a, a few weeks to give you the time on your boat that you want? The alternatives are indeed very limited, but consideration of that sort of thing may just give you the little bit of flexibility that you need in the next few years. Um, next slide, please. And lastly, uh, the CA 180 days campaign. We've had uh, many members ask us about this. The original intention of it was to seek to influence UK and European government policies so that UK citizens could enjoy reciprocal rights to those offered by the UK to EU citizens, which is visa free stays of up to 180 days. But we were told quite categorically that this is not going to be altered. So rather than try to change things that were obviously not going to happen, we agreed that the best way we can help members is by gathering and then making available a good source of reliable and up-to-date information on the whole subject of extending the time that you can stay in the EU. Robin has already mentioned how we publicize what we do and that's how to deal, uh, how to get the information but most importantly please do let us know of your own experiences, how you get on, this is what enables us to give you better information. Thank you. I'll hand over now to Roger, who is going to update us on VAT matters. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I'm going to a bit of a whistle stop tour through the VAT issues. And uh, like the 
visa issues that Mark's just been talking about. I think the good news, if it is good news, is that the situation on VAT is now quite well established. I think it's quite well understood. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it's probably not going to change. Uh, that uh, the rules uh, have been subject to some update, particularly by HMRC, until well, around about a year ago. Uh, but I think now we're pretty clear that you know the rules are how they're going to be. So over the next ten minutes, I'm going to uh, just very briefly look at some general principles around uh, VAT liability on on yachts. It's, it's quite important that uh, many of you, being yacht owners, that you understand you know these basic principles. Uh, then I'm going to say a little bit about the UK approach to VAT status. Uh, and then the EU approach to VAT status. Then we need to think about both sides of the uh, of the divide here. Um, you know, the VAT status. If you have a boat based in the UK, and if you want to go into the into the EU, and then vice versa. If you have a boat located in the EU, what are the issues uh, if you want to uh, come uh, in, into the UK? And then I'll, I'll I'll give some advice on practicalities. What we should be doing. What we should be uh, uh, keeping um, in order to demonstrate demonstrate that uh, status. So some general principles here, and um, uh, the VAT status of VAT paid boats. So here I'm focusing on VAT paid boats, um, and uh, obviously for many years we've known that we've had to keep the original VAT invoice in order to demonstrate uh, VAT status uh, of yachts, and until uh, Brexit. Uh, as the relevant customs territory was the whole of the EU, then uh, for, for an, an awful lot of people, uh, you know, sailing between the UK, Ireland, the Baltic, you know, as far uh, as far afield as Greece, you know, that was all one customs zone, and so it wasn't an issue. But now um, we've got a situation that it's very clear that the VAT status of VAT paid boats depends generally on their location. It depends on their location at the end of the transit the brexit transition period and that was the 31st of december 2020 and that's that's a very important date uh for this vat analysis and also for um recreational craft regulation stuff that uh, richard is going to be talking about later so i do remember that date the 31st of december 2020 and what happened then was a, a, a division, I suppose, in that boats which were located in GB at that time um, were given UK VAT paid status, and that's referred to as domestic good status. Whereas boats which are in the EU at that time, EU 27, um, retained, because they obviously had up to that point, uh, retained EU VAT paid status. And that's irrespective of ownership. Uh, or state of registration, it was simply uh, by virtue of, of location um, and uh, technically speaking, boats with EU VAT paid status uh, quite often referred to as having union good status. And there's a really important principle here that VAT paid status is automatically lost when a yacht leaves the relevant VAT territory, the customs territory. Um, and that, you know, I think, was something that I, when I started to look into this, I didn't realise this. I, I, I thought that, you know, VAT payment was just something, you know, that, that carried, it was carried by the boat forever. But no, um, that when the boat moves out of the customs territory, it automatically loses uh, the VAT paid status, and that can be recovered uh, in certain, certain circumstances. Um, and the obvious, well, the, the main one is something called return goods relief, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later. And if, if return goods relief is available to a yacht, then when it comes back in to uh, the territory at a later date, then it can recover it, its VAT, uh, VAT paid status. And then the sting in the tail here is that unless there is some sort of relief uh, available to uh, the owner, then importing a, a, a yacht into the relevant customs territory, whether that's the EU or the UK, triggers VAT liability. Um, and uh, that's uh, pretty onerous. Uh, obviously, it depends on the um, location where the boat is being imported. We're looking at 
uh, a situation where somebody was importing a boat into Ireland just recently, and Ireland's got 23% VAT on, on yours. So that's, that's, that's quite significant. And I think other places, Sweden, may, may be 25%. So, you know, you're talking about you know, quite significant numbers. Okay, I'm just going to say a few words about the UK approach. And here I'm, I'm looking specifically at the UK approach on UK owned boats that did not obtain UK VAT paid status at the end of the transition period on the 31st of December 2020, primarily because they were lo located outside the UK. So boats which were in, like my boat in, in Ireland, um, in uh, or boats in France, in Greece, wherever they might be in the EU, they did not ob obtain or carry on having UK VAT paid status uh, at that, at, at that, on that date. And there are three key, key categories in, in boats in that stage. So both, these are boats outside the UK on the 31st of December 2020. And the good news is probably this, this is, for most of us, we're in this, this category one, uh, if you like, and this is uh, UK owns VAT paid boats that have previously been located in the UK during the period of you know, the, the current ownership of, of that yacht. And the good news is that uh, UK VAT paid status can be obtained through return goods relief when the yacht returns to the UK, as long as it's going to be used for non-commercial purposes, so just you know, private cruising, it's returned by the same owner. Uh, it's substantially un unmodified during its absence. Um, and now, and this is where HMSR, HMRC did make some changes last year, there's no requirement to return the, the yacht to the UK within three years of departure. That uh, and, uh, uh, HMRC, HMT automatically waives the three year re return requirement if the yacht is going to be used for the personal use of a UK resident. So it only applies to UK residents, uh, but that's very useful if you're, you know, if you happen to, like myself, have kept your boat outside the UK for, you know, quite a few years, um, or if you're going on extended cruising, then when you come back, there's no uh, three-year requirement there. The second category of, of boats is, is more unfortunate, and these are UK-owned boats which were in the EU on the 31st of December 2020, and uh, boats which had never previous been, previously been located in the, U, in the UK. So boats which had been bought, you know, say in Germany, in France, in Denmark, wherever, and, and never uh, been located uh, back in the, in the UK. Why should you? And for those boats, for, for whatever reason, we, we never quite really got to the bottom of this, return good relief is not available. Uh, there, you know, those boats have never been in the UK, so it's very basic level. I suppose you can see the the logic, but it, it's still slightly odd. It's it's slightly penal, rather well, well, more than rather more than slightly penal. It is very definitely penal to people in that situation. And UK VAT paid status can only be obtained in those circumstances through paying VAT following the import of the yacht in, into the UK. And then the third one is a slightly f fortunate uh, group of people um, who probably didn't realise what was going on. Uh, but they, they'd they got a boat which had never been previously located in the UK, so in some ways similar to Category 2, but for whatever reason it had been exported out of the EU prior to the 31st of December 2020, so maybe going on a Caribbean cruise or you know, it was located in, in, in Norway, for example, um, at that time, and for those boats, uh, return goods relief is available uh, as, as, as per yachts previously located in the UK. So if um, VAT is payable, and uh, we're actually getting a lot of interest uh, now on, on this issue, we're coming through to uh, the rats, uh, so there must be quite a lot of people out there in this situation. If VAT is payable yeah. when the yacht is imported into the UK, then the VAT is payable on the current market of the value as at the date of import of the, of the yacht. So not, not its original purchase price, and no, that would be penal, it's you know, what, what, it, what its value is. Um, when it's actually imported. And HMRC actually has been shown to be really quite amenable to the application of deductions on the purchase price. For example, you know, if, if the boat was purchased, as it probably was, including a VAT paid element, then that's, that VAT element in the purchase price you know, can be deducted, annual depreciation 
can uh, make quite a big difference. And if you bought equipment for the yacht in the UK and paid UK VAT and taken that equipment out to the yacht, so for example, I took uh, a, you know a radar scanner out, out to my yacht, you know, and bought the scanner in, in the UK and took it out there. Um, no, that was something. If, if I'd had to pay VAT, I would have, I would have claimed against. And uh, RATS has got some notes, guidance notes available, which I think are very helpful uh, to assist in deduction calculations if, if you're in that situation. But at the end of the day, you've got to recognize that agreement of the value is at HMR, HMRC's discretion um, and that VAT is payable within 30 days of the import of the yacht. So not much time to argue that. I'll just speed up a little bit and quickly run through the EU approach. Um, uh, for the EU, boats in GB, and here GB, Great Britain, so not, not, not Northern Ireland, that uh, was located in GB on the 31st of December 2020, lost EU VAT paid status. Um, and, uh, uh, but I say UK owned boats in the EU at that date did retain EU VAT paid status. So that means that boats, you know, which are located in GB now, which may want to go into the EU, um, you know, need to be able to, well, hopefully to avoid paying VAT on entry, they need to look out for you know, some form of relief, a couple of uh, obvious reliefs, um, and, and that's something called the 18 month temporary admission relief, uh, and it may well be that returns good relief is all also available if you uh, uh, just had your boat in in the UK for three years. There's no waiver of the three year rule uh, by the by the EU. Temporary admission. Uh, so this is for UK boats visiting the EU, and, and this is available for up to 18 months. After which the VAT does become due, and that's available for non EU residents. And that relates to the use of the boat, not the ownership of the boat. And the boat must be used for private purposes, so not not commercial charter. And the good news with this 18 month temporary admission clock, it's been very well used by Americans and Australians and New Zealanders over many years, so that the clock can be 18 month clock can be reset and you get another 18 month period. So it's not a rolling period uh, like Mike's visa issues, it's a full 18 month period. And that 18 month period can be reset simply by showing that the vessel has left EU waters. Uh, so back to the UK, or you know, if you're in Spain, go down to Morocco just for a couple of days. There's no minimum period outside the EU. Formalities. People ask us, well, what what documentation do we need to do need to show? And that's that's something which varies on a country by country basis. Greece, as you might expect, has the most formalities. The UK has next to no formalities uh, on import beyond you know just just issuing the SPCR. Um, and that has problems because you know, in the UK, you really do have to keep the evidence yourself. Uh, the yacht owner has the primary responsibility to have, have evidence to demonstrate that status. We've all, always been used to the original VAT invoices, but now you also need to be able to have evidence of location at the end of the transition period, dates of temporary admission when you enter the EU in your 18 month period, uh, if you're relying on um, uh, EU RGR, then compliance with the three year period uh, is also necessary. So it's sensible to keep track of VAT paid status. And one of the things that I've developed is just a, a very simple spreadsheet here. You probably can't see the words terribly well, but I had my boat in Ireland. In fact, I had my boat in Ireland prior to July 9, 2019, um, but I, I started the spreadsheet then and I kept my boat in Ireland. It was there over the Brexit transition dates. So I got a letter of confirmation of location from the marina there. Um, and so I, I retained EU VAT status on the Brexit date because I, my, the boat was in the EU at that time. But then last, last year with the COVID restrictions having lifted, we sailed the boat uh, back up to Dublin in the first place and then over to, uh, well, up to uh, Northern Ireland and onto Scotland. So I lost EU VAT pay status by leaving the EU on the 30th of May, uh, 2022. And then I ob obtained UK VAT paid status on entry into the UK, um, actually in Bangor. So it was in Northern Ireland. That's, a, that's another story. Uh, but uh, you know, just a simple uh, spreadsheet like this is, is really quite helpful just in order to 
uh, you know, order things a little bit and to be able to show if, if people ask the questions, well, you know, what, what evidence have you got of the status of the boat at any particular time? So, as I say, it's really just uh, a bureaucratic overhead for most people. It's not the end of sailing as we know it. I'll hand over to Richard now, who's going to say a few words uh, on uh, CE and CA marking of yours. Richard. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Um, so we've got one last, and I'm afraid, highly technical uh, piece at the end. For that, I apologise. I've worked with Roger on the VAT, and um, now working on this, I'm amazed to find that this is, uh, that the matter of sea marking on boats is incredibly similar in some of the concepts, but utterly and totally different. It's a stoat and a weasel. A weasel is so easily distinguished because a stoat's totally different. Um, this, so I will try and make it as informative as possible and as simple as possible. I'll do my best. Um, you will recognise, I hope, the symbol at the top right, the CE mark. Uh, I wonder, you probably never even thought about what it means, um, but uh, it's actually to do with product safety legislation. All relevant products have to carry uh, the CE mark before they can first be put into service. And the requirement is on the manufacturer to do all necessary safety checks to check that it, quality, that it satisfies the regulations that are out there. It, they have to find out what it is. They do it for you. And if they are satisfied, they uh, put the CE mark on the product. It can be sold. Uh, and uh, what they're saying is this satisfies the essential requirements, the things that are required could be all sorts of things. It strays from lifting devices, medical devices, there's all sorts of regulations. The manufacturer decides what's relevant, puts the marking on, it's yours. It applies to the product, irrespective of uh, ownership, uh, and it endures. And um, I guess once you've bought something, it doesn't matter at all until there's a transfer of ownership because without a CE mark, the new owner formally or legally, pickily, can't use it or shouldn't use it. They could be pulled up by uh, safety standards, the, uh, the, the council safety people, uh, for using it. Now, it's unlikely to happen. And it wasn't a problem until Brexit. Brexit causes complexity. Um, so, let, a quick bit of jargon. Uh, the CE mark is the European trans-European marking for, uh, for safety. Uh, for boats, the relevant part is the RCD, the Recreational Craft Directive. You have a CE mark. In future in the UK, we will do something different. We will have the UK CA mark. It replaces the CE mark uh, in, uh, or by, it's happening already. You may have seen some, mainly on electrical goods. It will be fully in place by the 31st of December 2024. It looks like that, UKCA, uh, and for boats, the regulations will be the recreational craft regulations. They're subtly different. Well, the name is different. Currently, fortunately, RCR replicates the original CE, uh, the, the original um, EU RCD, and therefore. It hasn't actually changed, uh, but how it impacts you has, and it may drift in future, but that's where we stand. The other thing that's happened is our markets have, and territories have changed. We had EU, what we'll call EU 28, and for the sake of discussing this, we have to be very specific about what these are. EU 28, pre-Brexit, we now have EU 27, the, well, Europe without us, which is a new territory legally from this point of view, and then you have UK or, or GB as appropriate. Uh, and uh, that's the other side of the divide. Northern Ireland, I'm not touching on now. If you need to ask the question, please don't. Um, and um, it's actually not that difficult, but it's also not at all clear. Um, so, and then finally, I'm gonna use a shorthand. I'm gonna say, does it qualify? That's not a legal term, it doesn't mean anything, but otherwise I'm going to be talking about long reams of stuff about satisfying the requirements of et cetera, et cetera. From our point of view, does my boat qualify for this? Is it okay or is it not? And that's how we're going to work it. So let's have a look at some of that. Um, we're going to look first of all at Europe, which hasn't changed. So in Europe, if I had a boat uh, which had a CE mark already, was bought since 
1998, I think. Uh, we, I mean, right, the whole thing was a gray area when we started looking at this because nobody had thought about how this impacted on secondhand boats because you don't really sell secondhand things, do you? Unfortunately, some secondhand things are expensive and do get sold like planes and boats and so on. So we have the EU27. What is your status? If you had a CE mark boat, one that came to you with a CE mark, it endures, and it had been sold, sold at any time once, maybe not to you, in the EU27, in other words, not, not UK, it's okay, it qualifies. Also, if you have a CE mark boat, which was in the EU27, not UK, uh, sorry, not GB, on transition date, it also qualifies, but most of you are now happy from the Europe side of things. So now for the next one, what about pre-CE mark boats? And look carefully at the centre there. Ah, so pre-CE mark boats in Europe are fine. It, nothing's changed. Pre-CE, it was good. CE came in, well, it's just a change, but they're still legal. However, the way in which you get your CE marking qualification by being there doesn't qualify the pre-CE ones. So that little triangle in the middle appears where you don't qualify if you're a pre-CE boat, an older boat, a boat pre-1998. Uh, so we'll come to what you have to do. And then finally, the people who spend a lot of money on good, beautiful wooden boats from pre-1950 are anyway explicitly excluded from the regulations. Let's look at UK. A grey area. CE marked, sold in GB fine. C-marked in GB on transition date, fine, exactly like Europe from this point of view. Actually, there's an explicit extension in the UK that if you bring it back to the UK by the end of 2024, 31st December 2024, you will also be seen to be covered. And in fact, I helped Robin bring his boat back last autumn for this reason. We didn't then know the extension to 2024 was going to happen, but it has. So, Lots of white zones, that's fine. Guess what? The same triangle appears for pre-CE. Uh, so, and then finally, pre-1950 boats. So we have a picture. Most boats will qualify. And there are grey areas, and those are the people who need to consider uh, what they have to do. Uh, I will touch on that in a moment. So. To a few other quick notes. Boats can qualify in both territories. I said it was the same but different. You can't do that. In fact, you flip flop between. The, in here, you qualify in both. Uh, so that's uh, uh, and that will endure unless it's modified. If your boat is significantly modified, even under the old CE marking, you had to then consider whether it needed to be covered again. Um, new boats. If you buy a new boat, insist that it's already been checked and stamped with UK CA as well as CE because then it's much, much easier to move forward and make sure that uh, it, it was okay. Um, boats that don't qualify in the territory, it need to be assessed and certified by a notified body before they can be used there. And that is called a post-construction assessment or a PCA. I'm hoping there's a one point that I'm not sure. Right, so who needs to do that? And the answer is only those in the remaining gray areas and only when the boat changes hands, because it, you're, it, this C marking, the, the, reg, the requirement only occurs at the point of first putting into use. So actually, as long as you're not selling your boat, it's not a problem. It's only when you sell your boat that it becomes a problem. And if you bought it in Europe, and that is why it's in the gray zone in this country, well, you can still sell it in Europe because it still has its European CE mark. So it's awfully complicated. There's not that much, uh, there are not many boats caught. If it matters, it matters. That's the trouble. And that's why we've had to go through a lot of uh, heartache doing it. So if you do need a post contract uh, construction assessment in order to sell your boat in this country, et cetera, is it hard? The good news is I've said RCI is the same as RCD. Uh, so it needn't be onerous. It could be mainly paper based. Um, talk to the notified body who's going to do it early and they can guide you through it. They can reference the old stuff, the old C marking, and uh, they have some discretion. The bad news is it will have to meet the most recent regulations, not the ones when it was built. So there is going to be stuff to be done. 
um, and you'll be need you'll be required to do the necessary upgrades grades to meet that. The key areas are likely to be a Blackwater holding tank and a means for the person, the single-handed person on board, to recover themselves from the water unaided. Um, and finally, I was asked to mention engines. Uh, engines actually are separately CE marked. Therefore, if you buy a new one and fit it, it'll have a the new engine will have a C mark. So that's not going to be a problem. There's been a lot of worry about uh, the emissions regulations having changed so much. What happens? I think we're going to see our way through that. I'm not going to go into it any more detail there. So in summary, the markets are separate. Uh, UK CE will take over and. Uh, what you need to do is to look at where your boat has previously been sold at any time in its lifetime. And if it's got a sale in the UK, tick in the UK. If it's got a sale in, in Europe, tick in, the, in Europe uh, to any of the previous owners. And um, uh, don't worry until you sell it. Um, if you do need to get your boat back by the end of December 2024, if that matters to you, I hope it doesn't. And keep good boat documentation. Same as with the bat, because you have to regulate it. Uh, you have to you have to show what, uh, the status of your boat when it's sold. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much, Richard. I think that's made us all a bit dizzy. Okay, we're going to break now, and we'll resume at eight twenty. <laughs>